and Bible doctrine, week number eleven. Tonight we begin a new set of a new study, a new set of notes on eschatology. Eschatology, and we are uh, this is this is going to wrap us up for this semester tonight and next week. All right, but the study of eschatology. But we'll pray together, and then we'll we'll dive into it. All right, Father, guide us. We pray. Thank you for the blessed hope we have in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Eschatology. Now, what is eschatology? That is the study of last things. The study or the doctrine of last things. So tonight we begin a a study on prophecy. What is coming? What is going to happen? What is on God's prophetic calendar? What's on the timetable? And I trust that these things will be an encouragement to your heart. All right. Just to begin with tonight, let me give you and point out the the key scriptures here in eschatology. And if you have those before you, if you would please, John fourteen verses two and three. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And notice the Lord said, I will come again. I will come again. Acts 1.11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen Him go into heaven. I can't read this verse anymore without thinking about everybody on the day of the eclipse, you know. I stand ye gazing up into heaven, right? I mean, I did it. (laughs) You know? (laughs) But that's what the disciples were doing, and they were reminded Christ is coming. 1 Corinthians 15, 51-52 Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That would be a great verse to hang in our nursery. You know that? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> but nevertheless, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a hope we have. 1 John 3, 2 Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And then finally, Revelation 22, 20 He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Now these are not all the Bible references or promises on prophecy or the coming of Christ, last things, but these are some key scriptures that we ought to know. Okay? So that being said, let's begin an outline tonight. And we have a chart too to to look at as well, so that'll be nice. But let me give you a few things here as we build an outline of eschatology. All right, Number one, we're going to talk about the promise of His coming. The promise of His coming. We have a promise. Jesus has made us a promise, and it's the promise of His coming. We are a people who believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming back. Letter A, the promise has been clearly made. And we find here different people that God has used to reiterate this promise. Number one, it was a promise made by the Old Testament prophets. By the prophets. We were just reading or studying about Zechariah, right? Let me give you a Bible reference. Zechariah 14, verses 3 through 5. Zechariah 14, verses 3 through 5. And in those verses, listen to this. The Bible says... Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when He fought in the day of battle. Listen to this. And His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. 
And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst toward the east and toward the west. There shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto us all. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. The Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. The Zechariah 14 tells us that the Lord Jesus, when He comes this time, is not coming to Bethlehem. That prophecy has already been fulfilled. But Zechariah says He's coming to the Mount of Olives. And so we know the exact location, the exact place that His feet will touch the earth when He returns. It's the Mount of Olives. So, a promise made by the Old Testament prophets. Matter of fact, you can even write down another reference. Ezekiel 21, verses 26 through 27. 21, verses 26 through 27 as another reference. But it's a promise by the Old Testament prophets. Ezekiel 21, 26 through 27. <clears throat> Number two, we have here a promise made by the Lord Jesus Himself. The promise made by the Lord Jesus Himself. John 14, verses 2 through 3. And we've already read that, but the Lord said, I will come again. I will come again. John 14, 2 through 3. All right? Now we have, thirdly, uh, it's a promise that has been made by the angels. A promise made by the angels. Please write down Acts 1, verse 11. Acts 1, 11. We have a promise of His coming and the angels referenced it. The angels said it. Acts 1.11. And that's where the disciples, you know, the Lord Jesus ascended and they stood there gazing up into heaven and the angel, two angels appeared and they asked, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus shall come, you know. And um, it's the promise that we hold to and the angels have said it. Christ has said it. The prophets have said it. And then fourthly, it's a promise made by the apostles of Christ. The apostles of Christ. A P O S T L E S. The apostles of Christ. And let me give you a few references on that. <clears throat> Paul said it. 1 Thessalonians 4 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 4 13 through 18. Peter said it. 1 Peter 1 7. And 13, 1, 7 and 13. Peter said it. Paul said it. John said it. 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. So here's the promise of His coming. The prophets in the Old Testament said He was coming. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself said He was coming. The angels of God have said He's coming. And the apostles in the New Testament have said He's coming. So the Old Testament said it. The Lord Himself said it. The angel said it. And the New Testament said it. I don't know about you. That's a pretty good reason for me to believe He's coming again. You know? That's a promise that the Lord has made to us. And we find letter B that this promise will certainly be fulfilled. Certainly. It is a certainty. There's a lot of things that are not certainties. But this one is. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a statement. And you may wish to write it down. Here it is. Death is only a possibility for the believer. Death is only a possibility for the believer. But the second coming of Christ is a certainty. Death is only a possibility for the believer. But the second coming of Christ is a certainty. We, we, may, we may very well be the ones to hear the trumpet sound when the Lord Jesus comes again. Death is only a possibility. But His coming is a certainty. That will happen. That will happen. Write down a reference please. Revelation 22. Revelation 22 verses 7. 12 and 20. 7, 12, and 20. And matter of fact, the last prayer of the Bible, the Lord Jesus said, Surely I come quickly. And the last 
prayer of the Bible says, even so, come Lord Jesus. The last prayer of the Bible agrees with the Word of Christ. Good lesson there. Let your prayers agree with the Bible. You know, But He said, I'm coming. So the Apostle said, even so, come Lord Jesus. Christ's Word became the basis of His prayer. You know, But anyway, surely I come quickly. So that's the promise of His coming. Number two, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about the program of His coming. All right, The program of His coming. So we have the promise, and we're going to deal with the program of His coming. Now there's many things that, we'll have, that we will, God willing, Lord willing, will be touching base on. Because as, you're, as you know about eschatology and prophecy, you know that um, there are many subjects of uh, the tribulation, uh, the Antichrist, um, the millennial reign of Christ, things like that. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to cover kind of a survey of those things. But just for, to kind of whet our appetite for tonight and kind of set the table. Letter A, the second coming of Christ will take place in two phases. And this is important to know, two phases. Number one, the rapture. The rapture. The rapture. So please write down the word rapture, if you would please. And then underneath that, you see a note there. This is His coming to the clouds for the saints. This is His coming to the clouds for the saints. And there I would ask you, you've already referenced, made, you've already written down the reference, but it would be good to write it down here as well. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. That is the classic passage on the topic of the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. So this is His coming to the clouds for the saints. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. But let me give you number two, and then we're going to look at a chart together. Okay? But number two, remember, the, the coming of Christ is going to be two phases. One is the rapture. Number two is the revelation. The revelation. Revelation. Of course, you know that word revelation means to unveil, to reveal, to unveil. But the revelation. Now this is His coming to the earth with His saints. This is His coming to the earth with His saints. So, you have the rapture which says that there is going to be a meeting in the air. Now, there's an old song that says there's going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet by and by. You may have heard that. But that's the rapture. He's going to snatch His bride away. But then, the second phase, if you will, of His coming is the revelation. Because the Bible promises every eye shall see Him. And He's coming. And He's going to deal with the armies of the Antichrist. And He is going to rule and reign over the earth. That's His revelation, you see. So the rapture, the revelation. Now, let's look at this chart together. Could we please? And I hope this kind of helps us as we just kind of visualize a timeline of events. Alright? The second coming of Christ in two phases. Now, you may wish to write a few, a few things down just as a comment or two somewhere in, the, in your margin. I want you to make note of this though. There is nothing left to fulfill before the rapture can happen. There's nothing left on the calendar. There's nothing left to fulfill before the rapture can happen. Nothing. What I'm saying is, is we believe His coming is imminent. That there's nothing that has to be done first before Scripture says He, he comes. There's nothing left to fulfill before the rapture can take place. Now that's important because, and, and understand what I'm saying here, I'm not belittling anybody, I'm not doing any of that, but just understand that you know people sometimes may talk about different signs or things like that that need to happen or things. Somebody might talk about uh, red heifers and somebody might talk about blood moons and all that type of thing. But here's what I want you to know. There is absolutely nothing that has to be done first before Christ can come again. His coming is imminent. He can come at any moment. That's what I'm trying to say. 
So nothing left to fulfill on God's prophetic calendar before His coming can take place. All right. As far as the chart here, notice please, you see here that there's a cross there. And on that line underneath the cross, the words are written, the church age. And the number of years is unknown. We are living in that time period. That is where you are. That is where I am in this church age. You remember the church began with the Lord Jesus Christ and His disciples. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. We've studied this last couple of weeks. The church was a mystery in the Old Testament, but Christ revealed it and built it and began it with His coming in the New Testament. We are living in that time of the local church, the church age. Now, the Bible does not tell us how long the church age will last. It does not tell us it's going to be 500 years, 1,000 years, 3,000 years, none of that. All we know is this is where we are. What we also know is that the Bible says Christ is coming in the clouds for His saints. So you find here, we see where it says phase one, the rapture. That is where the Bible says the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So there's coming a time. It might. It could be tonight. I don't know. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. I don't know. But all I know is Christ is coming. And the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus is going to pull His bride out of this earth. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And then the Bible says, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up snatched away. That, those two words caught up is where we get that word rapture from. Caught up, snatched away, taken out of this earth. The Bible tells us the Lord Jesus is going to, the dead in Christ are going to rise, and we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And the Bible also tells us you and I should be in the business of comforting one another with these words. We ought to remind each other of the blessed hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's, what we see here in Scripture, the rapture of the church, His bride will be called away. Did you know that in the in uh, Jewish days, and Eastern days, did you know that there was a certain way they did weddings? And a man would betroth a wife to himself. Now, as far as legality is concerned, she and he were not yet married, but they were connected by legality. He had betrothed her unto himself. So she was not to be for another man. He was not to be for another woman. But then he would go away for a time to prepare a home and a place for his new wife. They were not yet married. Betrothed, yes. But he is going to prepare a place for them. And then after he gets everything finished like he wanted, Jewish tradition tells us that he would then come, his coming would be announced, and they would celebrate and uh, her family would throw a large celebration and a feast and it was considered an honor to sit down at the table and to eat with the family and things like that. And people would celebrate. And then after which, he would take his bride and he would lead her off so that they could be together for the rest of their lives. Now if you think about it, that's the way an Eastern wedding took place in Bible days. If you think about it, the Lord Jesus has betrothed a bride to Himself. He, the Bible says He loved the church and gave Himself for it. Then He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And so some glad day, the announcement's going to go forth. The bridegroom is coming. The bride will be called up to meet her bridegroom. And there we shall ever be with the Lord. Now what happens after this rapture of the church? Well, the Bible tells us that there's a period of time called the tribulation. The tribulation. And if you would please, I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Alright? Now there's a lot of discussion about these things and timelines and, and that type of thing. But I take the position myself, I take the position of what is called pre-tribulation, which means I believe the rapture will happen before the tribulation begins. And then after this tribulation time, Christ will come to the earth and set up His kingdom and begin the millennial reign of Christ, which we would call that premillennialism. Pre-tribulational and premillennial. That's the position I hold. 
And I'll show you that in Scripture, if I may, if you bear with me. Daniel 9. Now, bear with me on this. It'd be, it'd be good for us to just take time to dive into the whole passage. Um, for time's sake, we'll not be able to go into all of this, but I will try to, my best to show you a couple of things. Daniel 9 and verse 24, please, if you will. Now remember, we're, we're going to deal here for just a moment about the, the tribulation. All right, Daniel 9, 24. Look at this, please. The Bible says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Daniel 9, 24. All right, now verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. All right, now let's just time out for a second and just slow it down and look at this. In verse 24, we read of 70 weeks. Right? 70. In verse 25, I don't know what that is. <laughs> We're still here, so it's not the trumpet. Amen. In verse 25, we read that this 70 week period, this calendar, would begin with the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now that happened under the Persians. Cyrus told them they can go back and rebuild, right? Then the Bible says also that it would that it would come to the Messiah, the prince. The Bible says here that it would be tallied up in verse 25 of 7 weeks, so 7 and 3 score, 3 score that means 60 and 2 weeks. So 7 plus 60, plus 2 is 69 weeks. Everybody with me so far? So 69. Now the Bible says, so we have, in verse 25 he speaks of 7 weeks, and then there's 60 and 2 weeks. Then in verse 26 he says, and after 3 score and 2 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. Now who is Messiah, by the way? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says He would be cut off. When we read of somebody being cut off, we're reading of them dying. We're reading of them being taken out. Right? Well, he's cut off, but not for himself. Meaning, of course, that he did not die for his own sin or for his own iniquity or anything like that. Thank God he died for my iniquities and my sins. But he was cut off. Then the Bible says, and but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come. Now notice there's a change here. The prince that shall come, that is a lowercase, little p-r-i-n-c-e, the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he, that is the prince that shall come, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations, and he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, I know that's a lot, but let's just unpack that real quickly. In this 70 week stretch, here's what you need to know. Number one, the word week, when we think of week, a week, how long, how, how, how many days is that? How many days is that? How many? Seven. The word week means seven. That's what it means, seven. When we think of a week, we think of a period of seven days, not six days, not two days, not 18 days, seven days. That's how I would describe. I would say if next week, I mean seven days from now. 
But the word week means literally seven. It's a period of sevens. That's what it means. Well, if you study here and discover from the rebuilding of Jerusalem to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, He's not speaking of seven days in a week. He's actually speaking of seven years in one week. So that's the time period being broken up. And so when you read this, you see, we see Jerusalem going to be rebuilt, Messiah be cut off. And all of that together tallies up to be the 69 weeks. Then he turns around and he says, but there's a prince, a king, a ruler who will come. And he's going to make a covenant with many for one week. That is seven years. So when you hear and we say the tribulation will be seven years on the earth, where do we get that from? Right here. Right here. And the Bible says there'll be a, a covenant, a peace deal, a peace treaty that'll be signed. Now here's the thing. Christ is coming to gather His bride. Sometime after that, there's going to be a leader who steps foot on the scene and is going to make a peace pact for seven years. It's going to look good. It'll sound good. Everybody think it is good. Except for the fact that it's a big, total, gigantic lie. And it's called, God calls it the tribulation. And in the middle of that, He's going to break His peace deal. He's going to break it. And He's going to unleash wrath and fury, doing everything He can to wipe out every Jew He can possibly find. This is called the tribulation period. At the end of that seven years, we find Christ is coming again to the earth. That's where you read of Armageddon. That's where you read about how that the Lord Jesus, when He comes and executes judgment, the blood shall flow up to the bridle of the horses. That how, that's how deep and thick this battle will be as Christ comes and deals with Antichrist and His armies. And He puts an end to the wickedness of this earth and puts an end to the Antichrist. And Christ rules and reigns on His throne and sets up a millennial kingdom on the earth. Now I'll show you this to conclude tonight. And we're going to, God willing, go into more detail of this next week. But I will show you this. That you see here, after the tribulation on your chart is the millennial, the, the 1,000 year reign. And you have a reference there, Revelation 20 verses 1-7. through 7. And then at the end you find the great white throne and eternity. Now, underneath that you find some comparisons here of the rapture and the revelation. The rapture is imminent. Happen anytime. The revelation takes place at the end of the tribulation. In other words, the rapture in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The revelation, everybody sees Jesus and He's coming. And He's not coming as a baby in a manger. He's coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The rapture is sudden, secret, as a thief in the night. The revelation, however, is not secret. Every eye shall see Him. The rapture is Christ coming in the air, in the clouds, as 1 Thessalonians said. The revelation is Christ coming to the earth to rule and reign. The rapture is where all the saved will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. The revelation, however, is where the saints come from heaven with Jesus to the earth to reign with Him a thousand years. And the rapture is a literal, physical event. Not spiritual, not mystical, not some spiritual kingdom that nobody knows about. or not. No, it is a real event. The revelation is also a literal, physical event. Not a spiritual kingdom in, in the sense of nobody sees it or knows it or anything, but in the sense of it is a real kingdom. Jesus Christ will literally, truly sit on the throne of David and rule and reign over this earth. It will happen. So the rapture and the revelation, and you have references there on both of those, the rapture and the revelation. And those two are different. And there's distinctions of those two in Scripture. So we, we know that there is a rapture where He catches His bride. There's a revelation where Christ comes again in His feet 
steps foot on this earth. He's coming again. All right? So that's a very, very quick, brief overview of a lot. <laughs> but um, Lord willing, next week we're going to go into more depth about the tribulation and some of the events surrounding that, the judgment seat, the great white throne, things of that nature. And so I want you to be here for that as we finish up eschatology. All right? Very good. If you have any questions, though, just get with me. But I love you. We're going to conclude there. God bless you and God speed. And let's finish strong this semester. And let me encourage you, do everything you possibly can by the good help of God to make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure you're back again in the fall. And let's finish strong. I'm so excited about folks next year and coming years. We're going to have our first graduates next year, if God be willing. And then more to follow the year after that. And on and on it goes. We're excited. All right. And so I want you to do your best. Finish strong. Father, bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Have a good night. God bless you.